Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to examine a radical new technology for spaceflight, which is successful, could enable spacecraft to travel more than a thousand times faster than they do today. The project is called Breakthrough Starshot, and the goal is to launch a space probe to Alpha Centauri, the next nearest star, and have the trip take a mere 20 years instead of the 30,000 years it would take with current means of propulsion. But the ultimate goal is to find out if there are other intelligent species out there that we might be able to communicate with. My guest is Pete Warden, Executive Director of Breakthrough Initiatives, an umbrella group that includes Breakthrough Starshot. Pete was previously Director of NASA's Ames Research Center, which is one of the world's top space research facilities. He's a retired Brigadier General in the U.S. Air Force. He has a Ph.D. in astronomy, and he's long been recognized as one of the world's leading space experts. Breakthrough Starshot is funded by a $100 million grant from Russian philanthropist Yuri Milner. Other notable people actively involved in the project include physicist Stephen Hawking, Sergey Brin of Google, and Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Pete, welcome on the program. Well, thank you, Marty. Delighted to be here. Good to have you here once again. Uh, tell me about this new technology. How do you plan to make the distance to Alpha Centauri in just 20 years? Well, one of the problems with any space flight is that all of the systems to date, you have to carry the fuel with you. So, for example, the space shuttle, when it took off, you know, weighed hundreds of thousands of tons, in fact. Uh, but most of that was fuel. Uh, if you wanted to go to the nearest star in any reasonable amount of time, uh, if you calculated how much fuel it would take to take something like the space shuttle, it would take more fuel the entire mass of our galaxy. And that doesn't look feasible. But once you accelerate to a certain speed, can you cut the fuel and just keep going? I I exactly. If you can get to the high speeds, then it'll just coast all the way. The idea that uh, is actually an old one, uh, it was really developed uh, in some detail in the early 60s, is you keep the fuel on the ground. And you basically use an even older technology, you use a sail. Uh, but the, there's no wind in space, so you, you, for wind you use the pressure of light. Uh, so that provides the, the motive force, but it keeps all of the fuel on the ground and enables you to now accelerate uh, an object at much higher speeds than we could by carrying the fuel with us. So you're saying that by shining a very bright light on a spacecraft, you actually exert a push on it that it will accelerate it to high speed? I I exactly. This is a photon pressure. Uh, in fact, if I, had a, if I was in space and I show, shown a, a flashlight on something, it would accelerate it now, very, very tiny amounts. But with very high power lasers, you can get a lot of push. Uh, so this is a laser light sail, as we're talking about, and we believe we can accelerate something to a thousand times faster than we go today, indeed something like 20% the speed of light, uh, which is 60,000 kilometers a second. That's pretty fast. So the laser is based on Earth, and the satellite or the space probe is already in orbit somewhere, and you just push on it with the laser and it goes? Precisely. This is exactly what we would do, is that we would have... Uh, the what we call star chips, which would be the interstellar probe, placed on a mothership in space, which would then deploy them, and then we would push from the laser on the ground uh, to these very, very high speeds. Now, we actually have a video of this, so the video will demonstrate what the project is about, and there's no soundtrack on it, so I'd like you to kind of explain what we're looking at. So can we go ahead and see that video, please? Well, here's the video. This is the array of lasers, which we would have at a very high altitude location. Uh, then you would deploy the sail, which includes a very, very small spacecraft. The lasers then fire for a few minutes. Uh, in this case, you see them firing up into space. Uh, they then hit the sail and push it for a few minutes to accelerate it to very, very high speeds. Uh, and then you would launch another one, perhaps uh, a day later. Uh, ultimately, we expect to launch hundreds, if not thousands, of these towards the nearest star. Uh, again, it's only a couple minutes. Then once the sail is going at 20% light speed, it sort of turns over so it doesn't hit the dust in interstellar space, or very little of it. Uh, after some 20 years in interstellar space, the, uh, the, what we call the star chip, uh, 
will approach the Alpha Centauri system, which actually has two stars like the sun, uh, would then fly by a planet that we hope to find uh, in the system, take images with an onboard camera, uh, and then after it flies by, uh, after it recorded these pictures in an onboard storage, uh, could send the, the data back. So after it flies by, it sort of has a small laser on board which fires a laser signal back towards the Earth. Uh, it would take four and a half years to get back. Uh, and then we actually use the laser array that we sent it as a receiver. So we then receive the laser signal, convert it to digital information, uh, and get uh, uh, the images of a planet four and a half light years away, we hope. So you have a payload, and I understand the payload is pretty small. In fact, I think you have a mock-up version with you. Could we see what the actual space probe looks like? Can you hold it up? I exactly. This is a mock-up of the Starship. Uh, it's this little, tiny, several millimeter object. Uh, we've gone through, and all of this uh, technology exists today even, to develop this. It has cameras, it has a power system, a small radioisotope battery, uh, it has lasers uh, that can both maneuver the spacecraft and eventually send it back. So this is the size of the Starship. Now, in addition to this, it has a light sail, which would be maybe 10 feet across, that the laser pushes on. So the whole spacecraft would weigh about a gram. Uh, very, very lightweight uh, uh, technology, and it's developing very, very rapidly. So the whole spacecraft is just the sail and that little chip. And that little chip has a built-in camera. It can take pictures. And from four light years away, it can send a signal that you'll be able to receive on Earth, pick out that signal from all the digital space noise out there? I exactly. All of this uh, physics uh, has been shown to work today. Now, there's a lot of engineering challenges, to be sure. Indeed, we've identified some 26 challenges, which we've challenged the world to, uh, to focus on. But we're going to initially spend the $100 million you mentioned to try to address some of the key challenges. Uh, well, what are some of the key challenges? What are the most difficult hurdles you have to overcome? Well, there's a number of them, but I would say the number one is the, is the sail itself. In order to have a sail this light that, that is 10 feet across, it's only a few hundred molecules thick. When you fire this laser, it's 50 billion watts of laser. That's an incredible amount of power. We have to make sure that the, that the sail reflects most of the energy and absorbs almost nothing, something like under a hundred thousandth of the energy, uh, and doesn't fall apart. That's pretty hard. Now, our calculations show that this is feasible, but it hasn't been done yet. So our first challenge is going to be to develop the material. Uh, we hope to, in a few years, take a small piece of this material and show that you can accelerate it. Now, the second challenge is the laser array itself. This laser array that sends this thing will be a kilometer on a side. Uh, we need to be able to build that so that it's cheap enough that we can afford it. We'd like to have the total cost of the system be comparable to a big science project like the particle accelerator in Switzerland uh, or uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Today, it, that's not affordable, so we have to develop lower cost lasers and be able to manufacture them. Now notice it's a whole bank of lasers instead of one single big laser. Precisely. This has been a major breakthrough in the last few years. You know, today, when you transmit radio waves, you use a, a phased array where each individual element contributes to the, to the, to the radio wave front. The technology in the last few years have been developed. We can do the same thing with lasers. We can take small lasers that, that may be a few kilowatts. There would be something that would be about the size of a flashlight. We would put millions of them in an array. They could all act in concert, so they are locked with each other, phased is the word it's called, and then fire a laser beam that acts as a single, uh, single beam that could then push the, this uh, laser. That technology is there, but to make it affordable, we really have to do a lot of work. Now, it looks like the sail is moving when the laser beam hits it. I mean, how do you aim it, and how do you keep the laser locked on the sail? Because as soon as the laser hits it, it's going to start moving away at a very rapid rate. Well, this is, again, one of our challenges. Uh, you've hit another a key one, is to be able to focus the beam and hold it on the target. Fortunately, uh, that the lasers would be electronically steered, so they don't need to be physically moved. This is a technology that you can do today with, uh, with, with radio waves. Uh, we need to do it with optical uh, wavelengths, which are much harder uh, to do and, and a higher uh, technology. But we think we can do that. So, it's, so that if the sail starts to get off a little bit, 
we'll be able to have a feedback loop so we can we can put things back on. Uh, so that that's the another key challenge is to aim it so that it goes towards the near star system in a very very precise manner. It would seem like if the sail were not exactly perpendicular to the laser beam, it would go off to the side and miss the target by billions and billions of miles. Precisely, that's a challenge. Now, we, we are able to do some uh, efforts today. One of the things is we would shape the laser beam so that if it starts to go off, it, the, there would be a little more energy on the, on the outside of a donut shape, which would then send it back in the right path. So this is one of the technologies we're going to have to develop. Now, as far as the chip itself, it's really tiny. So now what will the capabilities of the chip be, taking pictures and sending them back? Yes, this little chip uh, is, again, a model, but we can build one uh, in the next year or two, and we're looking at that, that would have a, a tiny camera. Uh, indeed, this, is, this chip's about the size of the, of the chip in, uh, in an Apple phone. Uh, so it would have a little tiny camera. It would have storage uh, uh, for dozens of, of images uh, that, uh, you know, a, a few million bytes each. Uh, it would have a computer that could, that could guide things. Maybe most importantly, it has a number of small lasers. These little lasers uh, can do two things. One is the small lasers, you can fire them, and just as the, as the chip is pushed initially with laser, these can move the small chip slightly. It gives us a little bit of maneuvering, so if we're not exactly on the planet in the Alpha Centauri system over 20 years, we can do a slight bit of maneuvering. And then finally, that laser can fire the signal with the image data back towards the Earth. Will it be sending data during the entire trip, or will it go to sleep and wake up in 20 years when it's near the system and then determine if it needs a course correction? Well, we don't have any way to know where it is in the, in the intervening space, uh, and it'll be slightly active, sort of in a, in a standby mode. So we wouldn't communicate with it for the, the whole 20 years. And we'll probably lose us a number of these. So that's one reason we're going to send hundreds, maybe even thousands, uh, so that some of them will make it. All of them identical, or maybe you'll try variations? Well, that's so an excellent one... question. We're going to, we, we've convened a scientific group of about 30 of the world's best scientists in the relative technologies. Uh, they will recommend, you know, images, of course, are incredibly important. You'd like to see uh, if there's a life-bearing planet around the nearest, uh, nearest star system, uh, you'd like to be able to see continents and other things. And, of course, the, the real home run is if you find there is some evidence of civilization there. Uh, we have no evidence of that, uh, but uh, that's we, by images. Do we even know if Alpha Centauri has planets? Very good question. Alpha Centauri, right now, we, we don't know it has planets. A few years ago, uh, there was a detection around one of the stars. Alpha Centauri is an interesting star system. Unlike our solar system, there are three stars, three suns. Uh, two of them are about the same size as our sun. Uh, if you put the bigger star right where our sun is, the, the slightly smaller star would be about where Saturn is. Uh, we think that uh, all stars in the galaxy have planets, where that's what Kepler showed us, including binary stars like that system. But there's a third star that's, uh, that's at a, a fairly big distance away, but it's still in the star system. There's been a very intensive study for the last few years on that one, and we, we hope that results from some of these studies will show planets. Uh, we are, are looking at ourselves using some of the world's biggest telescopes to determine if there is a planet, hopefully like the Earth, that, that we can go visit. So what do you think the chances are that there will be a planet? And that the device will be able to detect because it's easy to see that it'll just go right through the star system and not even see the planet if it's there. Well, we, we need to find out ahead of time. Uh, so we have some initiatives to... So it knows what to look for. It knows what to look for. And we can see even from the Earth if there's a planet there. We certainly can't get any detail. Uh, but we hope in the next five to ten years to determine if there's a planet of the right size and location around Alpha Centauri A or B, or the third star, which is called Proxima Centauri. Uh, as I said, the Kepler mission, uh, which I had the honor of leading the center that did that, s showed that essentially every star in the galaxy has planets. Uh, and indeed, probably about a quarter of them have a planet sort of like the Earth uh, in what we call a habitable zone, meaning there's li there could be liquid water. So I think if there's three stars, I'd say the chances are better than even that at least one of them has something like the Earth, now whether it has life or it's exactly like the Earth, that's what we're going to find out.
So would you say the ultimate goal of this is really to see if there are other intelligent civilizations out there? Uh, I exactly. Uh, of course, Breakthrough Starshot, which is just one of our initiatives, is the one that's looking at, at the nearest stars, sending something by to see where they are. But we have another initiative that we started about a year ago, uh, announced by uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and uh, Yuri Milner in London, where we're starting to use some of the world's biggest radio telescopes and optical telescopes to look for intelligent signals. They could be anywhere. Uh, so we've got a number of efforts. Uh, our ultimate goal is to answer the question, are we alone? Now, related to that question, we have another video which deals with that issue. So let's go ahead and view that video, and then we'll come back and discuss it some more. We are here. This is home. But for most of our history, we knew only our cradle in the corner. We awakened on this tiny world beneath the blanket of stars, without a note to explain where we come from, who we are. We inhabited a tiny universe, oblivious to the rest of the cosmos. It was only four centuries ago that we began to use science to reveal nature's secrets and her laws. What is science? It's an epic journey of discovery. It's a continuity of minds. It's standing on the shoulders of the giants who came before us, looking out across a valley, over a hill, up to the sky, and asking, I wonder what's there? Oh, that view is tremendous. It allowed us to look across space and time, see the scale of the universe, and our place in it. We now know that our galaxy alone holds hundreds of billions of stars, and that the visible universe contains at least a hundred billion galaxies. In the last decade, we have discovered over 2,000 planets beyond our solar system. It's now estimated that there are tens of billions of habitable planets in our galaxy alone. Are we content to gaze at all these stars, all these worlds? from afar? We have taken to the sky. We have stepped off the earth. We have walked on the moon. We have landed on planets and comets and venture to the edge of deep space. Where now? You know, when we consider how old the universe is and how much progress humanity has made in just a few thousand years, it would seem reasonable that there could be many civilizations, many millions of years ahead of us. So the question is, why aren't they here? Or are they? Well, that's one of the fundamental questions of science. It was first articulated by Enrico Fermi uh, in the 1950s. It's called the Fermi Paradox. Uh, and he asked just that question. He said that you know, the, the sun is not a particularly old star. It's uh, maybe a third the age of the universe. Uh, uh, there should have been stars much older. If life is everywhere, and we have every reason to believe it is, then perhaps intelligent life emerged many times, and it developed to the point where it uh, uh, could think about traveling between the stars, which we are now for the first time doing. So the question is, uh, why aren't they here? Why haven't we seen evidence of that now? Of course. There are some people that claim we have, although uh, I certainly, you know, haven't seen any such evidence. But uh, uh, our point is that for now, for the first time, we have the ability to really look using science and actually start thinking about going there. It may turn out that, that uh, life is very rare, intelligent life is even rarer, that we may be the only intelligent species nearby, but we really need to look for it. 
Now, if we come up with an intelligent species, are we assuming that they'll be friendly and that we'll get along okay? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there's a lot of argument about that. Indeed, uh, one of my uh, sponsors, Stephen Hawking, is, is quite concerned uh, that, uh, that it may be they're hostile. Uh, there are many people that are worried about uh, should, we, should we signal to, if we find an intelligent signal. We want to reveal our location. Exactly. On the other hand, there are people that say, well, they should be much more advanced. They can teach us things. The key thing for us is in, in, our, in our initiative is we need to first answer the question, is there anybody there and are they sending a signal? Then, of course, uh, it's a big question of what we do. This may be the most important opportunity for humanity to begin to think together about uh, uh, do we answer? What do we say? Uh, indeed, is one of the other initiatives which we've announced but have not yet said the details is what we call breakthrough message. So we have, we're going to have a global contest for people to think about what we might say, uh, but we've made a commitment. We're not going to send anything because we think that needs a lot of discussion globally. So if we're going to introduce ourselves to the universe, what impression? I remember there was a big debate because a plaque was sent out a couple of decades ago. I think Carl Sagan designed it. And there was some, like, what do we want to tell the world about ourselves? And some people were saying, well, we should tell them how bad we are and what a terrible civil, you know. That's not what you want to say to strangers. I don't think you want to play up your good side. Well, indeed, you know, this is a very interesting question. Uh, uh, Carl Sagan's uh, widow, uh, Anne Druyan, is one of our advisors and on our advisory panel, she's the creator of the Cosmos series. Uh, you know, she helped design some of these things. So that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, it's something that, that, that bears a lot more thought than, uh, than most people give it, uh, is if you meet somebody new and you don't really know their intentions, very, very deep thought is really required is, is do you say anything? Should we assume that they're like us? Should we be projecting ourselves onto, you know, like warlike species that will fight to the death for an advantage? Well, we hope not. Uh, in fact, we hope that, that we'll find a signal and there'll be answers to some of these great mm -hmm. questions. Uh, you know, what is our future? Uh, how can we make sure it's a good one? Uh, but there again, there's always sort of dangers. But the first step is we, we need to, to find out how alone are we? Now, as far as our listening ability, let's say that there was somebody with our technology sitting on Alpha Centauri right now and aiming it in the direction of Earth. Would that equipment be good enough that they could detect intelligent life on Earth? Well, we did some calculations when we announced our projects the last couple of years. Uh, it turns out that actually with the technology we just now have, particularly the computer processing and ability to pick a very faint signal out, we could actually detect just now on Alpha Centauri uh, that accidental signals, that if, uh, if, if there was a planet around Alpha Centauri that had a civilization like ours and they were using uh, air traffic radars, uh, if they were using very, very powerful uh, directed systems to do their own uh, efforts, then we'd be able to see them. Uh, now, if they're using powerful lasers like what we're talking about, we can see those much further. We could see those halfway across the universe. Uh, if they're sending signals particularly towards us, which means they know that there's something here, uh, we could see a radio signal comparable to what we can send out using our largest radio transmitters today, such as the Arecibo radio telescope. We could see that almost all the way across the galaxy. So there's a lot of different things. Some signals would be easier to see, some would be harder. But the interesting thing is just today do we have the technology with data processing to be able to pick these signals out of the noise. So some signals that are created by an intelligent society would have a particular pattern which would be different from background radiation? I exactly. That's what we need to look for. Uh, there's a, been a lot of discussions about what kind of signals these would be. Uh, th there hasn't been a, as much work done for the last decade than it was done before, which is kind of ironic because we now just have the capability to do that. So one of the other initiatives the foundation has is what we call Breakthrough Discuss. This is an annual conference. Uh, we held the first one at Stanford University in April where we collected people. That particular conference, we asked the scientific community, what would you look for to look for laser signals like what we're thinking about sending our Starship? And they came up with some really good ideas. So we're, we're trying to kind of move this all together as a, as a coherent scientific effort. Now, does this technology have practical use? Let's say we're just exploring the solar system. 
could we use this technology to get to Mars more quickly, for example? Well, absolutely. It, it, it turns out that, that you know, we, we could send this chip, you know, at 20% light speed. Now, that means we'd get to Mars in about, you know, half an hour. Uh, but uh, we could send much bigger things, uh, maybe in, in weeks. Uh, today, a rocket takes a good bit of a year to get to Mars. So this same technology can send space probes all the way around the solar system much, much uh, more efficiently. So we think this is something that will benefit mankind, not just can we think about for the first time interstellar probes, but we think about really capable ability to, to do science and exploration and even support uh, human activities throughout the solar system. What about human activities? Because when you accelerate something that quickly, the G-forces would be pretty difficult to deal with. It would probably crush anything. So could people possibly be transported with this type of technology? Well, a, a beamed energy uh, to a sail, uh, of course, uh, you'd, you could use a bigger sail. You don't accelerate it as fast. With a much larger system, say if it was a, a spaceship that weighed many tons, the acceleration would be relatively small. You could then push it. Instead of for a few minutes, you might push it for hours or even days. So it's actually a, a, a new capability. It's called directed energy propulsion. We think it has huge potential, not just for, for you know, mankind's exploration of the nearby stars, but for a lot of other capabilities uh, that, that really has significant advantages over conventional rockets. Now, you're in the proof of concept stage right now to prove that the idea is feasible. Just very quickly, because we're almost out of time, how confident are you that it's going to work and that it will prove uh, successful? Well, obviously, I'm very confident. Uh, on, the other hand, on the other hand, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of work to do. Uh, we're going to spend the next five years uh, with the initial $100 million solving the two biggest problems. If we're able to do that, we'll go to the next phase, which we think will be privately funded at about a mm -hmm. billion dollars. Uh, to demonstrate a prototype, and then we, we of course, would hope we get public-private partnership in the next decade after that to build the real system. Uh, I think it'll work. Now, I've got a lot more questions I'd love to ask, but unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to ask them today because we're out of time. I'd like to thank my guest, Pete Warden of Breakthrough Initiatives. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.